So this video is an update to my earlier IB1102 repair and, and update video that uh, is elsewhere on my channel. Um, in this one, uh, I may be asking you for your advice a little bit later in the video, so watch out for that. But basically, uh, after everything was working perfectly, I ran into uh, a fault in the meter, and that's what the, fir the, uh, the subject of this video is, and I thought you'd find it interesting, particularly if you happen to own a, Heath a Nixie based Heathkit um, frequency counter, the 1101, 1102, 1103, and so forth, that looks like this, where the Nixies, in fact, are socketed. Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, so I want to show you what the fault is, uh, how I diagnosed it, and pretty, I think I found where the problem is, and that's where we stand right now. So let's get going. So here's the issue uh, that I found. Um, so right now I'm feeding the counter from the signal from the RF generator about 33 megahertz or 33,000 kilohertz or if you prefer here 33 megahertz but let's keep it in the kilohertz uh, because I want to show you what the problem is so as we keep moving up uh, the uh, RF our, uh, our RF generator up in frequency 34 megahertz 35 megahertz 36 megahertz 30 7 megahertz, 38 megahertz, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, oh, let me, I didn't skip over 47, there it is, 47 something, 48, okay, here's what happens, 49, and more. So here's 50 megahertz. Notice um, the problem is the 5 and the 6 digits on the most significant digits are lit. So there's some sort of short there. It's the only explanation. And we keep going. So this is 50 megahertz, 51, 52, 54, 55, 56, 57, 59. That's got to be 60 megahertz, 61. 62, 5, I'm going a little faster, 6, 7, 8, 69 megahertz. And uh, we just crossed into 70 megahertz here. Okay, and we can keep going. And by the way, this counter uh, can is rated up to 120. Obviously, I'm in the kilohertz range. I only have these eight digits, um, so this, will, this range will max out at 90. 99999, if I can actually get it there. And one nice thing about having an RF generator, huh, I just went over 99 megahertz, is, so here's 99 megahertz, and 99, and here's 100, 100 megahertz. Uh, notice the overlight is lit. So at least I know that my rewiring of the overlight works. So that was good to know. And uh, obviously if I want to measure that, I can then simply put it into the megahertz range and now I can go to I can crank her up and that's actually about as far as my signal generator goes so the the frequency counter is rated I believe to 120 megahertz and it will go a little further uh, but the signal generator is actually only rated to 110 and it can see it can go up to about 118. Um, so back to the problem at hand. Um, if I go back to the kilohertz range, yeah, we're here. So the question is, you know, is this 53 megahertz or is it 63 megahertz? And the problem is, you know, is it a big problem? Well, it's annoying um, because one would like to know where we're at, but you can certainly figure it out in context. Uh, for example, in, you know, in the amateur radio context, if this is uh, 50 megahertz-ish, uh, or 53 megahertz right now, we're, we're smack somewhere in the 6 meter band. Um, if it was, uh, if, it's in, if it's really 63 megahertz, 
then we're in the non-existent amateur 5 meter band, which doesn't exist. So in an amateur radio context, uh, if you were measuring the output of your transmitter and, and it, everything was working properly, uh, you'd know that you're on 6 meters and you're on 53. Um, now, is this really annoying? Well, no, because um, what you can do is, if you ever reach this spot, um, so is this 50 or 60? I don't know. The easiest thing to do, of course, apart from thinking about it in context, is to simply push this switch over to the, uh, the megahertz range, and now we know where it's 60. And of course, we can dial it down. Here we are at 50 something megahertz. Um, again, somewhere in the middle of the uh, six meter amateur band. So we can certainly, if, you, if we ever see this, we can simply flip the switch and now, and now we know whether it's a five or a six. Fortunately, this problem is actually pretty easy to diagnose and pinpoint. Uh, it's the fix that we're having problems with. But let's see where the problem is. So here's the entire schematic of the IB1102 counter. Um, just for reference, here are eight Nixie tubes. Um, the ones from the left is the least significant digit of the unit's digit. Um, the one all the way on the right is the most significant digit, which is the one we're having uh, trouble with the uh, the five or six digit. So we're we're going to zoom in here and move stuff around. Keep zooming uh, because there we go. That's good enough. So here we are zoomed in on the most significant digit, which is the offending one, all the way to the left on the display. Uh, this is the one with the offending five and six digits. Um, just below the Nixie tube here is IC123, which is a 7441, which is a, a 4 to 10 decoder and driver specifically designed to, uh, to drive Nixie tubes. These tend to be uh, tend to be unobtainium. There's also the 74141, which is functionally uh, compatible. If you need to, if you would need to replace it, and we'll see. Uh, below that is a 7475. Uh, this is simply a four-bit latch. Um, and by the way, all of this is straight TTL. So when I say 7475, I don't mean 74 LS 75 or 74 HCL. And none of that. This is uh, none of that rubbish. This is straight TTL from the 70s. And below that is this IC121, which is a 7490 decade counter. Uh, wired to count from 0 to 9. So if we, if it's very easy to, to see where the, where the issue here could be. So here we are fully zoomed in to where ultimately the only three places uh, that could be causing this problem. The first could be the Nixie tube itself up here. Uh, it could have an internal cathode short between its 5 and 6 cathodes inside the tube. Uh, that would suck and would mean I'd have to uh, find a replacement Nixie tube. The other place it could be at fault would be the 7441, which is the decoder driver chip here, IC123. Um, it could have a short or some sort of internal logic error, which is causing uh, its five or six outputs to always change in unison. Um, that could suck too, although replacement replacement 74 uh, are, are easily, well, relatively easily available. Um, finally, the last and only last place uh, that could be causing this would be somewhere on the connection between the chip and the tube. Um, so on the chip uh, that's being driven, the five and six digits are being driven by pins 14 and 11 respectively. And by the way, those two, those pins are not close together, obviously, because it's, it's a 16-pin dip. Um, and they're driving what Heathkit labels as pins 5 and 6 uh, of the Nixie tube, which are two traces on the PC board, which are in fact very close together. And so that's uh, entirely a possibility. So we're going to easily find where the problem is. And finding where the problem is is going to be quite a bit easier than actually fixing the problem, as we will soon see. So this here is IC123 on the schematic. 
Um, it's the it's one of those eight seventy four forty one Nixie drivers. It's basically a four to ten decoder uh, that can sync on the order of, you know on the order of hundred ten volts. So it's designed to drive Nixie specifically. Um, and I could tell because I've swapped these two, and the uh, the issue remained on the first digit. I also took the panel apart, as you'll see later, and uh, swapped two of the tubes. And again, the, the problem stayed on the most significant digit. So when I measure the, um, when I have the chip out and the tube out, there is nothing else connecting uh, these pins to the tube. So there's no possible short path within the chip or within the tube. And when I measure the resistance between uh, pin 14 and pin 11 here of IC123. Those are the two outputs which drive the five digit and the six digit. And they have, resi they, uh, they're not, sh it's not a dead short, but it's on the order of 90 ohms. Uh, it should be of course infinite. Because uh, when I measure any between any of the other pins going to the Nixie tube, it's of course open because there's no Nixie, there's no IC, there's nothing there. So there is a short uh, somewhere on a trace, or a partial short somewhere on a trace. That 90 ohms is enough of a short to light up both cathodes uh, when either one is being uh, energized, and, and so that's the root of our problem. So here's a static snapshot of the uh, front of the IB1102 um, torn apart. <laughs> Uh, to get to the so PC board and the Nixie tubes and the chips, uh, it's upside down here. So the most significant digit is all the way on the right, on the bottom right of this circuit board. Uh, and you can see the traces sort of in vertical rows. We'll zoom in on those in a second. Uh, that's where it appears the problem lies. It's important to understand uh, how Heathkit uh, has you m mount the Nixie tubes into sockets. So there's the Nixie tube on its side uh, with the wires coming out of it. They're not pins, they're wires. And they're going through a, plas a black plastic spacer, which I believe comes with each Nixie tube. It's, it's actually part of the Nixie tube part. And that spacer gently <laughs> rearranges those wires into a rectangular arrangement. And then those wires get shortened and become pins which then plug into a mate, the mating socket uh, which you'll see uh, shortly and at least the underside of it in a nice rectangular arrangement. Here's another view of the underside of the spacer with the Nixie tubes wires poking out through it. You could remove the spacer entirely from the wires, but then good luck lining them all up to get them back to the spacer, so you avoid one avoids doing that. Don't ask me how I know. Um, and so then the, pin, the wires are all the same length, and then this more or less gently plugs into a mating socket, which is, of course, soldered to the PC board. You won't see the socket because I could not get a good shot, shot of it, but you will see the underside where it's soldered to the PC board. So this is also a little bit of a digression, but I think it's really interesting. I've built a lot of clocks for some strange reason, and many, many of them with Nixie tubes. And basically Nixie tubes come uh, that are socketed all have solid pins, you know, like a vacuum tube, which is kind of what it is. Um, other Nixie tubes have flying leads. Sometimes those are, are soldered directly to the PC board, but I've never seen Nixie tubes with flying leads socketed. Well, this is this was a first. Um, what I call the spacer, Heathkit calls the base in this instruction page. And the purpose of the base is really interesting, or this, the spacer, if you will, because it helps you, you slide it down uh, as you're pushing it over the tube, the socket, and that lines up the pins so that when you then push the tube down gently, uh, all the pins are lined up into the socket, which is pretty clever, I suppose, if, uh, it, and it's the only way I've ever seen leaded uh, Nixie tubes socketed. But it does work.
So as you just saw, the raw Nixie tube wires coming out of the glass Nixie tube go through a plastic spacer which rearranges uh, the wires into two neat rows and the rest of those wires is what plugs into a socket which is what's soldered on the other side of what you're seeing here which is the most significant Nixie tube position on the PC board. You're seeing the underside of where the socket is soldered in. Um, there are two, the, t the socket presents as two neat rows of six pins. So that's 12 pins because a Nixie tube, uh, these Nixie tubes have of course 10 cathodes and they have a decimal point and they have an, of course an anode. Fortunately it turns out, uh, well to, to a great extent, that the five cathode and the six cathode pins wind up on the two front uh, positions here of this socket, the ones closest to the edge. That might be a good thing. Um, and I, when I removed the Nixie tube and when I removed the uh, 7441, which is this chip just behind it up here, uh, that left these two traces nominally isolated. There's nothing else which connects to those two traces, yet they had about 100 ohm, 90 to 100 ohms of resistance between them, which at least, at least for the NICs for driving the cathodes is, is equivalent to a short. Um, I checked very carefully visually. I couldn't see anything. Plus, I know that neither of these two pins is shorting to anything else other than to each other because no other no other digit combinations are, are seeing this so this is not shorting to for, for example and the other interesting thing is both of the traces from five and from six are on opposite sides of the pc board it's a dual sided board and one's going to pin 11 of the ic up there and the other one's going to pin 14. so then those two pins are far away from each other uh, so they're, they're not, they can't be shorted up there. So I looked very carefully right here between the two pins. There is nothing. I removed all the flux, as you can see, between uh, all the pins around here. And there's nothing shorting on this side of the board. So my guess, and please comment if you think my guess is off base or if you have a better, a better guess, and I'm really open, um, is that some flux residue made it to the other side of this board perhaps uh, between these two pins the five and six anode pins under the socket uh, and that flux residue became conductive over the decades or semi it became semi-conductive so again this is not a dead short between these two pins but it's enough of a semi short uh, to light the two uh, light the two cathodes all the time uh, you can see that no one 50 or 60 years ago bothered to remove any flux whatsoever because Heathkit never told us to remove flux. Um, but after I carefully removed all the flux, uh, that's what I was left with. So that's my guess. Um, now, how do I fix this? I tried, obviously, with my FR301 desoldering gun, which is a wonderful instrument to, you know, slowly desolder each pin, but it became apparent that I could never get uh, enough solder off uh, from between, from, from inside the, the hole, because these are plated through holes and double-sided. I tried. Uh, also, I didn't want to ruin the, uh, the traces. The traces on Heathkit boards are, are fragile enough as they are. So what I might have to do is find perhaps some other way of heating, removing the Nixie tube, of course, and heating all 12 of these traces uh, at once to try and desolder it, clean up the mess, whatever mess is under here, make sure nothing else is shorted, and reinstall it. But I'm going to need some advice on, on how to proceed. If you have a way of, can think of a way of heating all of these pins here at once enough to desolder it, or perhaps to dig in underneath the socket between the two pins on, on the other side of this board. I don't know. This is where I'm, I'm kind of reaching out for some advice. Fortunately, all, the, all eight Nixies on the counter seem to work fine themselves, uh, which is a good thing. Nevertheless, I would like to try and identify the tubes, um, just to look into how unobtainium they are. Um, I, I'm usually pretty good at that, but uh, here are three picks of uh, the tube, the most significant tube. I can't seem to quite read this properly, 
and identify it. It sort of reminds me of an IN14 except that, well, the 2 and the 5 are not mirror images of each other. They're, the 2 is a distinct character, if that helps. So, if there are any Nixie aficionados out there who can say, oh, well, that's a whatever, I'm all ears and uh, I would appreciate it. Thanks.